It's Tuesday, February 18th, 2020. My name is Ashton Ellett, and I'm here with another installment of the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Joining me today is Ms. Lee Agnew. She's the former assistant to Georgia House Minority, Le Minority Leader Michael Egan, as well as Georgia Senate Minority Leader Paul D. Coverdell. She also served as Mike Egan's administrative assistant, uh, assistant during his tenure as Associate United States Attorney General during the Jimmy Carter administration. A longtime political activist and consultant, Ms. Agnew has volunteered and worked for high-profile Georgia Republicans such as Newt Gingrich, Johnny Isaacson, John Linder, and of course, Mike Egan and Paul Coverdell. Since 1983, she has worked in the area of corporate and nonprofit communications as the owner and operator of her own business, Right to the Point. Last but not least, she is a graduate of the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication here at the University of Georgia. So thank you very much, Lee, for taking some time on a yet another rainy, <laughs> dreary morning here in uh, Northeast Georgia. Um, Glad to be here, thank you. Really do appreciate you making the trip over. Um, I wonder if we could begin, just tell me a little bit about your childhood and your upbringing. I was born in Atlanta, grew up in Atlanta, in Southwest Atlanta. And um, in the same neighborhood my parents had grown up in, uh, everybody I knew was a Democrat. And uh, we, we had a suspicion that we had some Alabama relatives who might have voted for Eisenhower. <laughs> <laughs> but no, everybody was a Democrat. Sure. And um, when I was in the seventh grade, it was 1960, and we had uh, our social studies teacher organized a, a campaign that fall for us to choose sides between Kennedy and Nixon. I was the chairman of the Kennedy oh, campaign. Okay. So that was uh, the only political experience I really had up until, um, until I was in college, and that was late 60s, mid late 60s, and uh, the atmosphere was, everybody was involved in politics right. in some way or another. And I was, became a fan of Eugene McCarthy in the- uh, This is already off to a very interesting start. Well, it, it was, actually there were, there were two, the 66 governor's race, the Bo Calloway. Right. Was um, was another moment that was somewhat formative. Mm -hmm. Not in the sense that I was a big Calloway uh, person. I wasn't involved in the campaign, mm -hmm. although I knew some people who were. But the way it all came out with him having one pretty clear plurality mm -hmm. and yet the House going for Maddox, who was just a laughing stock type figure. Um, it it gave you pause as to how the state was being run and who was running it. And um, but then in '68 in that election there was just this among college students mm. there was this feeling of somehow or another LBJ has got to go, and um, and I got interested in Eugene McCarthy. Of course, that year turned into total tumult. Mm. Um, where I really became involved, uh, when I graduated from the J School, my first job was in uh, public relations at Six Flags. That was a new, it was like three years old. They had a big PR department, very active. And also in that, uh, working in that department was Catherine Thompson. She was the wife of Fletcher Thompson, who okay. was the congressman from the 5th District. From, from College Park, right. Southwest. Uh -huh. East Point. East was. Point, that's mm -hmm. right. And um, Catherine, through Catherine, I got an opportunity to work on Fletcher's congressional staff. And that involved moving to Washington. This was in 1971. Uh, it was the spring of 71 when I went up there. David Gambrell had just recently been named to replace, to fill out the term of 
Senator Russell, who had right. died that January. And, but Fletcher made it uh, apparent quickly that he intended to run for that seat. And so once that was the case, I was working on the congressional staff, but everything took on a political cast, more or less. Right. And um, th I was there through 71, and then in 72, which was the year of the election, that spring I moved back down here to uh, Atlanta to his field office staff because I was uh, responsible for his schedule. And Fletcher had made it, um, had, had made this promise that, I don't know if he lived to regret it or not, but as his scheduler, I'd, I sure regretted it, <laughs> that he was not going to miss any votes. And so trying to juggle campaign scheduling with him you know, the congressional voting right. schedule was erratic and unpredictable, and it was it was just mm, a, <laughs> a painful job. Much harder back then because they would work longer and, and more days a week, unlike now where it's pretty, you know, right. three or four days tops. It seemed like, and it just seemed so unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fletcher had his own plane, a little two-seater plane, and he would come and go uh, on his own. I mean, it wasn't like he was a hostage to the airlines. However, it was still just being able to confirm an, that he would be in an appearance and definitely be there and people right. could count on him and they could bring the community out. Oh, gosh, I made a lot of enemies. <laughs> and um, and I was, uh, I was really pretty young to be doing that. Um, but anyway, I made a lot of contacts and yeah. friends. As a result of that, a uh, couple of people I got to know in the campaign recommended me uh, to Mike, to Mike Egan, mm -hmm. to work. Uh, there was going to be an opening in the Minority Caucus staff uh, in the upcoming session once Fletcher had lost and we were all looking for work. And so that's how I got involved in the Republic with the Republican caucus and and that was really the beginning of my being involved in the party and in more broadly in Republican uh, affairs in Georgia mm -hmm. now who did you who did you work with and meet um, on, on the Thompson campaign that would sort of well Newt was one um. uh, Newt was one and another was a woman named Lee Jones. She was uh, a prominent Republican woman, very wealthy. Uh, she was married to Joe Jones, who was the aide-de-camp of Robert Woodruff. Mm, that's right. And, Joseph W. Jones, I believe. Right, and um, and she uh, she was she spoke to Mike on my behalf. I didn't even know she did that until he told me much later, but I knew Newt did. And um, so that led to an interview and that led to, to mm. that. But I met a lot of people in that campaign. Sure, sure. That uh, I was glad to have met. Well, that was, thinking back to it, you know, that, that's the Nixon-McGovern race, which turned mm -hmm. out to be a, a landslide, obviously, right. for, for, for Nixon. Um, a very close race against then state representative Nunn, later to be to be Senator Nunn. You know, I meant to check that, what the margin was. My recollection was it I wasn't it, that close. I think it was within a two points, maybe. Really? Um, I thought it was closer to six or eight. Oh, I don't think it was that, that um, we, we have human, human uh, knowledge at our fingertips right. here, but you know, th to me, it it always seemed like that you know, with an election that close, anything could have, you know, tipped the scales in 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 the Republicans' favor. In this case, Fletcher Thompson. What do you think it would have meant for the Republican Party to elect a, or or, or the Republican Party in Georgia, for a Republican to win statewide in 1972? 
I think the main feeling at that mm -hmm. time was that the Republicans felt robbed from 66. Right. So in some sense, it would have been, okay, this is our due. Mm -hmm. um, it's late and it's a different office. We'd rather be at the governorship. Sure. But, but still, we're owed this in almost an effect. I mean, I think that would have been somewhat of the feeling. If, if that had happened, um, that's an interesting question because Fletcher was not a big uh, party organizational guy. And I don't know how much he would have devoted to trying to build a party. That's a good point. But um, he might have. Certainly there were people who were working for him. Right. Lou Kitchen, for example, who um, were very much party building type. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lou was always looking for a campaign to promote. And there were right. other people in that race, um, our field staff. I mean, there would have been a, a group of folks who did, in fact, stay in politics. Mm -hmm. Buddy Bishop was, was another one. Um, but if we had had the success that year, that that would have been something to build on for right. them. Um, and I think we would have been able to recruit. Uh, but at the same time, Watergate was just about to happen. Right. And I didn't want to jump too far ahead because that and, and that's something that you talk to anybody who lived and worked during the, the 1970s on, on, on in the Georgia Republican Party. After 72, it was a very quick nosedive because of a series of Well, a data point events. on that, mm -hmm. uh, we had 29 Republicans in the House when I started working there in 73. Mm -hmm. At the start of the 75 uh, term, we had, I think, 22. So, uh, right. That that, was, that's not many people to lose, you know. Right. And percentage wise, it was mm -hmm. a big blow. But I mean, morale wise, it was right. too. Right. It just felt like whatever momentum there had been uh, was really gone, particularly now with Carter on the rise as a national right. figure. And, well, let's let's step back because we'll we'll work our way through that. But mm -hmm. but t tell me um, your impressions of, of of Mike Egan when you when you first met him and how would you describe because he's he's been gone for a while now and, and a lot of folks probably have no no, no memory of, of Mike Egan. But how would you describe mm -hmm. him his politics? Um, Mike was a very moderate Republican. Uh, he was a brilliant brilliant man. Um, he uh, he was a tax lawyer by mm. um, that was his field, but his um, sort of his scope of interest was was very much broader than that. Uh, he 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 sort of suffered no fools. Uh, he was not a hail fellow well met by any means. It was wonderful companion mm. to uh, just to hang with <laughs> in the office. Uh, I mean, just wonderful person to uh, to know. But he didn't. Uh, he, he suffered no fools. Um, Mike had these little half glasses that he wore down on the end of his nose, and he would look over those glasses, and uh, you knew that either you're going to get talked to or he had something serious on his mind. Uh, he, um, but he was, he was a brilliant man and a, and a really good man. Um, as far as he was motivated for all the right reasons to be in, in public service. His, um, he had gone into, um, or become involved in the Republican Party through his law firm back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, Randolph Thrower right. was one of his partners. And um, Thrower, I believe it was 56 that Randolph had run for a congressional seat mm -hmm. and uh, had won the popular vote. 
but the county unit system was, um, it was a special election, might have been. I'm not sure. Anyway, the county unit system prevented him from winning. Uh, I think he lost to a guy named John Davis. I, th I think uh, what, you, what you may be thinking of is there was, a, there was another lawyer who did run in the Democratic primary because the, the county unit system would only not applied. have been, yeah, that wouldn't have that, been that, in that, the that general. Was, that was Baxter Jones. That's right. C. Baxter Jones. That's Jr. right. And you may have heard this story, but Randolph, mm. it was Randolph telling, to, telling Baxter Jones, he said, well, you had the best of both worlds. You won the election, but you don't have to serve. <laughs> Um, but then Randolph did run for he Congress. Did. He did run for Congress. And I think it was in 56 he ran, but, right. but, but wasn't yeah. successful. I in the general believe. election, you, mm -hmm. a Republican was not going to win at that point. No, yeah, because, or maybe, maybe it was 52 and then, or 54, because Charlie Moy ran around that time as well. Um, in the 5th District? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm... That I'm blank on that. Or maybe Charlie ran in the fourth. No, DeCab would have been in the fifth at that time. Yeah. Before redistricting and everything. Uh, DeCab, it was a, yeah, DeCab and um, Fulton and I think Rockdale. I think Rockdale were, yeah. were yeah. that. Rockdale was definitely the odd man out in, right. in that district. Yeah, but um, anyway, back to Mike. Mm. He um, he was much more moderate than most of the caucus. Okay. It, they were more conservative. So he was still he, to the left even back then, e even in the 70s he would well, have been. I want to, he would I, appreciate uh, to the left. This, so, so more moderate to centrist moderate, right. than, than his, yes. He, um, in 68, he had been a national delegate mm -hmm. to the uh, Republican convention and he voted for Rockefeller. And Which says all you really need right, to know. Right, right. <laughs> Um, but yes, he was a moderate, and there were a couple of others in the caucus that were in that same uh, space, but most were well like, to the like right. Like Kill Townsend would have been. Kill. That, he and Egan would have come up, very, both attorneys, Buckhead. No, no, Kill was not an attorney. Oh, he might have been at one mm. time. But he was in the real estate business. That's right. He had the you know, hotels yep. and, and this and that. And yeah. George Larson was a moderate. Uh, George represented sort of the west, northwest, under Kills district. Okay. Um, he, uh, I remember him by zip codes. <laughs> <laughs> George was 30318 and part of 27. And kill was the rest of two seven. The, the things that, that, that you remember. <laughs> right. But um, but George was George was very much an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. And that was a big uh, push of his. That's what he was known for. So um, but they were uh, they were moderates. Uh, Harry Geisinger He would was, have been the whip. He was at that time. He was the whip. He was from Dunwoody. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wasn't as moderate as they were, but he was. Harry was from up north and just didn't have the quite the. Uh, so many of these guys had come into the party with Goldwater, right? And uh, that's not why Harry Geisinger was a Republican, but it was why many of these folks were sure. Republicans. Sure. Sure. So. Tell me, wh what kind of work were you doing in the minority leader's office? What, 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 was, a, what was a normal average day like during session? Obviously? Yeah. Uh, everybody wanted a newsletter. I wrote newsletters. Uh, everybody had correspondence they wanted answered. Uh, did a lot of that. And... Um, track, you know, track their legislation. Nothing was computerized much back then. Right. Everything was kind of manual. So I had some responsibilities for figuring out when a bill was going to come up in committee and making sure they knew. They would have known anyway, but it was just kind of an extra. Sure. Um, several of them just wanted to know 
that they wanted it systematically tracked as to where their bill was, uh, when it was going to be heard, what was happening to it. Make sure other people were notified, be there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing I did for some of them was uh, schedule their pages. Uh, everybody had, uh, could have a page or two during the session. Mm -hmm. uh, I did, did some of that. So we've already mentioned it briefly, but but 1974, that that, that so-called Watergate yeah. election, were you involved in the campaign, or, or who? What what were you do, doing during the the, the 74 I'm, cycle, which let's see, oh, turned out of course, so. uh, John Savage was running for a governor, and uh, I was involved with uh, his campaign. Uh, John was. Unique. I don't was, know if was he the did. dentist. Was he, he was. a dentist? He had a law degree, but he I know, but he chose to pull All teeth. Right. All right. <laughs> and uh, but he he was a dentist. He represented Southeast Atlanta, a very non-Republican district. And I think it was the seventy election. John had been on the ballot both as a Democrat and a Republican, and that was outlawed thereafter. Yeah. <laughs> He won as a Democrat, but he caucused with the Republicans. Um, he was just a very different kind of person, delightful. Um, didn't take himself all that seriously. Mm -hmm. He took his work seriously, but John... W one compared, hopes as a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Compared to the egos that some of them, for no good reason, sure. brought to the party, uh, John did not... Um, his ego was not what uh, some were, but uh, he was running for uh, for governor, and then but decided to run for lieutenant governor That's instead. Right. Mm -hmm. He started his thought was he'd run for governor, but then he ran. For Probably lieutenant should have governor. stayed running for governor with how things Ronnie. turned out. Yeah, Ronnie. Um, but uh, Susan Dillon was his campaign manager. She was a good friend of mine. Uh, I'll tell you who the other person very involved in John's campaign was, uh, was David Ralston. Really? David, I did not know that. He was a student at the time. He was, I think he was going to North Georgia. I think that was where he, he That would make in, sense. In school. Up in Dahlonega? Uh-huh, yeah. right. He was from uh, L.A.J., I think. Um, but, um, it was just this, it, it, Joanne Hayden Miller, and she was, uh, she, she worked on the Senate side uh, for the Senate Republican Caucus. And uh, it was, it was kind of this merry little band of just a few of us. Um, and it was fun, mm. even though it didn't turn out well. The, um, the other person who came in and out as more or less a consultant slash pontificator was Newt. Uh, Newt was running for Congress. Right. Mm -hmm. And he had uh, a guy, I don't know where he had come across Chip Kahn, but Chip Kahn was his, um, he was running his campaign. And um, we would have these meetings around John's uh, dining room table and Newt would show up and chip, and Newt would tell us everything we were doing wrong. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it, Newt was such a force of nature. Even that, then? Oh, yeah. <laughs> if anything, more then. Because uh, he just didn't have any baggage back then. He just mm. had, had ideas. Ideas. And, and, uh, and they were just amazing. Uh, I mean, he just presented them and, and started talking, you know, this was like Mao Zedong's uh, <laughs> uh, four or five, however many years in the wilderness he spent. His command of historical knowledge, there alone, just that alone made you pause. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Newt was, it, it was a fun time, uh, just 
as I think back on it, it was a fun time. But that was the campaign I was involved in in 74. Mm -hmm. I think Mike had a, a, an opponent that year, too, in the general. Uh, I think that was the year he, a woman named Penn Payne ran against mm -hmm. him. She was a lawyer. She's still around and active. I think she's, uh, you see her name occasionally in uh, something connected with um, with state government. Right. But um, anyway, he won, Mike won handily. He had a district that uh, he wasn't going to get beaten in. Sure. And, um, but I, I did a little work in that, but it was mainly just kind of handing flyers out. Mm. Uh, but John's, that was a different deal. It was, I was part of the brain trust, <laughs> which I guess goes to show you need more of a brain trust if you're going to win. <laughs> but, but Savage was, he was an interesting guy. Well, you, you mentioned Ronnie Thompson, who was at the top of the ticket. Right. And, and, and a very tumultuous campaign right. relationship with, with, with Bob Shaw, who was, who was the chairman right. of the Georgia Republican right. Party at the time. It, tell me about the fallout from the 74 campaign, and, and did, did you see it coming as, as... Well, yeah. I mean, there was nobody, no serious person thought that Machine Gun Ronnie was going to win, and uh, at least not anybody that I knew. Maybe there were some folks, but uh, nobody related to the Capitol right. folks thought he was going to win. But it was just this this um, snowball effect of Watergate at the national level and Machine Gun Ronnie at the top of the ticket. And uh, we had lost one of the two congressional seats we had. Right. Uh, because Fletcher, we lost that seat when Fletcher ran for mm -hmm. the Senate. And um, Andy Young uh, became... Uh, with congressmen. So the Republicans were just, we were just back on our heels mm -hmm. and um, in every every way, evidenced by the fact that our ranks were very depleted when the legislature came back into session. So yeah, you, you mentioned the, the losses in, in, the, in the Republican caucus. Tell me what, what we, we kind of skipped over this, but what was life like as the Republican minority the, the, the sort of rump in in the in the Georgia House. This was um, now you you spent time with with both Speaker George L. Smith and Speaker Tom Murphy. Um, can you describe the differences between uh, it, Georgia L. And, and Tom Murphy for for us briefly? Well, uh, George L. Um, he. He did. He never was overtly partisan. In fact, I think he kind of liked us. And he, I know he liked Mike. Um, and our, this is evidence by our space. We had a really cool space. Every all legislative offices then were in the Capitol. Right. We were on the fourth floor, right next to the elevator. Okay. And so there was a strategic location for getting to committee meetings. There were a lot of which happened on the fourth floor. And uh, it was a nice space for that time. And, um, and we, Murphy, Murphy never moved us out of it, but he wouldn't have given it to us, mm. if, if that makes sense. Um, and we were kind of afraid once George L. was gone that we'd lose it, but uh, we didn't. Um, The women in George L.'s office, his, his office, he had a staff of, of women, one of which was um, the, the woman who ran his office was Ernestine, and I can't remember her last name, but she really ran things. She was very difficult. Everything had to be, I mean, down to the gym clip, she had to be uh, approved by her. Uh, <laughs> The good thing was that when Murphy came in, that totally changed. Uh, the woman who ran his office, 
and her name was Shirley, and I, I can't remember her last name. She was delightful, and she kind of stood up for us. Interesting. Uh, yeah, and um, anyway, we, we kept our space, even though our ranks were very much depleted. Uh, same space, wasn't reduced. We didn't lose our Coca-Cola cooler. It was, it was all, all good. Um, Murphy was uh, overtly more partisan, but it was almost in a mocking way. I don't think he really, with one exception, I don't think he really had it in for the Republicans. Um, now he had been he had been speaker for half a term, right? And right. so coming into the seventy five election, and, and Bob Irvin was the one who really engineered this. The Republican caucus decided to push some rules changes in the House uh, related to open meetings, open committee meetings. Uh, this was rules related to how the House itself would run. Those sort of sunshine laws. Exactly. Were... But for the House, right. which was the master of its own rules. And uh, this was uh, not appreciated at all. Um, although the way it turned out, the, the Democrats defeated them with just a few defections, but then they wound up introducing their own modified version, and they just weren't going to give the Republicans credit, and they didn't appreciate being put on the spot. Mm. But it was a very uh, canny move by, led by Bob. Mm. Mike was all for it, but Bob really was the one that thought it up and and uh, shaped it. Um, but I remember that first day of the session when, and, and Mike took the lead. I mean, he was the one as the leader who introduced sure. him. Um, it was very heated. It was probably the only time I ever saw it heated strictly on partisan lines. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of heat for other reasons. Right. But, uh, but that was that was a Republican-Democrat moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I say, it was not appreciated, but the end effect was good. Right. So tell me, you know, you're working in the minority leader's office. How much interaction or work do you have uh, going between the state Republican Party and the, that, that sort of leadership? How much interaction did you have with the Bob Shaws and, and then Mac Mattingly after, after 75? Mm -hmm. Um, some, uh, but not much. I would, as I became more um, involved, particularly with Paul, uh, Paul was very much into party stuff. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Mike was not so much. He, he went to the county convention and sometimes the state convention, but he didn't really... He wasn't trying to... He did what he had to do, right. basically. He wasn't the, a backroom type of guy. And, and Paul, uh, Paul was very... Paul understood the party had the potential to be... to drive growth uh, and appreciated that fact more than Mike did. Right. Um, so I began to go to my precinct caucus, which was usually in somebody's living room, sure. uh, and then the county convention, and went to a few state conventions. Uh, I don't think I ever went as a delegate, but mm -hmm. um, I knew Bob, knew, other, knew Mac, knew other um, party, and they would, if they needed something or w wanted to get in touch with somebody, you know, I dealt with them on that level as a staff person there, mm -hmm. but um, uh, I didn't, I wasn't involved in anything that involved decisions, right. I guess you'd say. So when did you find out that your, your boss, Mike Egan, was, was going to Washington? Uh, well, let's see. Not too long, I think, after he had decided uh, that he was going. This would have been early 77. Mm -hmm. uh, he 
he asked me if I wanted to go and work up there, and I did. I just loved working for Mike. Mm -hmm. He just, it was always interesting stuff. Uh, I loved his family and still do. His wife Donna is a dear, dear friend. And uh, so his kids are, it's just a great family. And um, I, um, I wanted to go to, I'd been in Washington work briefly right. before, and, and I liked the idea of going back. So, um, so I did. So I think it was February of 77, the end of February, I was back up there. So tell me about transitioning from Atlanta, the, the capital, uh, to, to Washington and the Justice Department. Um, well, I, I was somewhat familiar with Washington. Uh, I was able to live in a place that I really liked. Uh, not that it was palatial, but it was a neat neighborhood. Where, where did and you live at? If, I lived on Cathedral Avenue off of uh, oh, Connecticut yeah. Avenue, oh, near yeah. the zoo. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it was a one-bedroom apartment, um, but uh, it, the neighborhood was, was really neat. I loved the Justice Department. Um, I loved I loved the work we were doing, which was, uh, Mike was over the civil divisions of the Justice Department, which included civil rights, lands, um, the civil division, tax, antitrust, I think that was it. And um, the main thing, though, that was so interesting that we did was Carter had made a big deal about merit selection of right. judges. And so that process, he wanted the senators to set up these commissions to take applications in effect and then make a recommendation uh, based on the merit of the candidate. Mm -hmm. And he particularly wanted more women and minorities. Sure. Um, so the management of all of that was really Mike's responsibility. Judge Bell put him in charge of that. This is Griffin Bell. Right, uh-huh, right, the Attorney General. That's right. And, um, and so that, that was the most interesting part because that really was political. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and yet it was democratic politics, so you could observe it without really being involved in it. Um, but it was it was really interesting. It, it's 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 odd, I guess, from our, our perspective in, in in 2020, thinking that here you have a, a a Democratic Attorney General, somebody steeped in Georgia politics, Griffin Bell, and he brings with him his deputy is is Mike Egan, who worked his way up as an Eisenhower Republican and House Republican Minority Leader. It, it seems like that would be an odd or possibly tense relationship. What was their working relationship, uh, Griffin Bell and, and Mike Egan's it's like? It's great. It's great. He, uh, he trusted Mike with this delicate job, yeah. really. Uh, but, you know, back then, there was almost a, well, there was a tradition that an incoming administration had a few people of the other party. Just like Kennedy had brought in McNamara, mm -hmm. and um, and and so the idea, I mean, the, you wanted a bipartisan uh, element to your administration. It would back then you did not so right. much now, but um, but anyway, Mike was part part of that. I mean, he benefited from being a Republican in the sense that he fill he checked that box. Sure, sure, but. Uh, but Judge Bell really did uh, give him great responsibilities, and um, and the way those the commission worked, the president mandated that for the circuit, uh, the, the appeals court level, right, there had to be commissions. He wasn't going to nominate anybody that hadn't come through a commission. Sure. And so these commissions were actually appointed uh, by the the Justice Department, when it came to district judges, that was up to the senators. Mm 
but they were strongly encouraged to set up commissions of their own. Some did, some didn't. So what, what would an, a, an average day at the Justice Department be like for you? Was it a lot of scheduling and, and, and stuff like that? or? Um, Average day. It was. I assume there there was, there was no average day. I, I imagine, but there, there was a lot of people in and out of the office, so scheduling was part of it. Um, there was a lot of um, just paper management. Um, we one thing we uh, all of the FBI files about candidates, judicial or. Uh, U.S. attorney candidates right. came through our office, Ooh. and um, while I didn't, I, I wasn't responsible for reviewing them. I was responsible for making sure they were in the right place at the right time, and that the chain of custody was right. <laughs> was um, preserved. Right. So, what did you what did you like most about uh, you know, living and working in Washington? Well, I, looking back, I wish I had taken advantage of more of living in Washington because there's just so much. Um, although Washington uh, by then, the late 70s, was becoming, um, I mean, there was a lot of homelessness, and that was troublesome. I, it wasn't something at that point I had seen much of in Atlanta, um, but it was... Uh, it was it was very evident in Washington, but the, you know there was just so much there. Uh, ju the Justice Department is, I think, the best location. It's between Pennsylvania and Constitution, mm -hmm. Ninth and Tenth. You're right at the Smithsonian. You're right. right at the National Art Gallery. You could walk to the White House. It's a good walk, but you could walk to the Capitol again. A good walk. Um, <laughs> nice slope all the way up. <laughs> But, you know, the mall is right there. It's just, it was an ideal location. Um, and the, um, the work was just very interesting. Right. It really was the, both the cases. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, you couldn't help but be oh, I'm sure. uh, yeah. aware of, of what. And, and we had some very passionate assistant attorney generals that were reporting to Mike, uh, a guy named um, Jim... What was his last name? He was the AAG for the Lands Division, and uh, he was just so into what he did. It was all about environmental uh, legislation, or not legislation, cases. And um, uh, a guy named John Shinnefield was the AAG for antitrust. Um, civil rights was Drew Day's. Um, you know, and there, there were always there was always a case that you were going to read about in the newspaper coming through our office, right? And that was that was neat. So I read I read in the the Constitution that you left your post and came back sometime in seventy nine. Mm -hmm. So w what prompted your 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 exit well, Mike, from Washington? Uh, Mike had left. Okay. Or was leaving. I don't remember. It was right about the same time. Um, I actually had an opportunity to to stay. Um, oh. Judge Webster, who was at the FBI, we had gotten to know him real well when he was being confirmed. And I got an opportunity to work for him, um, or at least there was an offer, was I interested sure. kind of thing. Um, and I really thought about it, but I just felt like Sooner or later, I was going to go back to Atlanta. Might as well do it sooner. Okay. Also, it had a conversation um, with two of Mike's uh, assistants, a woman named Frances Green and one named Doris Meisner. And they, they took me to lunch, and they encouraged me to kind of think bigger, I guess you might say, uh, in terms of my... They really sort of encouraged me to go to law school, which I didn't want to do. But... Um, Anyway, I, I just felt like it was time to uh, 
right. come on home and do something else. And I got an opportunity to go to work in Paul's company. Um, he was he and his dad had an insurance uh, marketing company, and uh, I, I had an opportunity. To, and I knew that in addition to the business, there'd be a lot of politics. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so that's what I did. So describe, you've already done this with, with Mike Egan, but, but describe Paul Coverdell, um, mm -hmm. his, his politics, uh, uh, his work ethic. Um, <laughs> his uh, work ethic. <laughs> his work ethic. Uh, he, was, he was the very definition of a workaholic. Um, he, and he was not easy to work for. I don't know what Molly said about that, but he was, he expected a lot of people who worked for him. And he, he was, um, Paul was a gracious guy, uh, but he had, he did expect a lot. Um, Paul, politically, he was moderate. He and Mike were very much in sync uh, in terms of where they where their position was in the party. Mm -hmm. uh, they were both considered liberal by much of, of the Republican um, whatever. The base. The base, yeah. We, I don't think we used that term back then, but sure. uh, their colleagues, for the most part, considered them liberal, more liberal than most of, of the legislature. Um, but they were in agreement on most things, and um, Paul was much more, as I say, tuned in on um, on party stuff. Right. Uh, before I went to Washington, in that space, but after Mike left, and before I moved, and maybe it was a little later than I'd said, but anyway, there was a special election to fill, um, let's see, Andy Young was nominated to the UN. That's right. So that vacated the fifth, uh, fifth district congressional seat. Paul ran for that. Should have made the, should have made the uh, runoff and would have had a great chance if he had. But I worked in that campaign. I had done something in the legislature that, that he was interested in me uh, using in, in the campaign. Uh, one summer, and I guess it would have been the summer of 74, uh, there was a court case that it made it appear that some reapportionment of Fulton County was going to happen. Mm -hmm. There was a, a, in addition to the single member districts, there was a three member countywide seat. And it looked like that might be thrown out. So Mike got me to work on that eventuality so that uh, there would be a new Republican seat in Fulton County and that the current incumbents would all be taken care of. I see. In terms of their districts having their house in it. Sure, sure. Um, so I had... Uh, done a lot, this was my manual work too, had these huge maps, centrist tra uh, track down to the block level, books with population in them, and then a lot of, um, I had to look at a lot of old voting history just to make sure I wasn't sticking somebody with uh, a bad, <laughs> right, uh, an unwinnable situation. and. Um, so I really developed some skills in that kind of thing, in looking at an area and, and evaluating the possibility. I say skills, that's probably too strong a word, but uh, I became um, experienced, I'll say, in thinking in terms of, okay, what, what's the history here? And where does that, what's the trajectory of that history? Right. And um, so anyway, Paul had me doing some of that in, a, in his very brief campaign uh, for that special election. So I enjoyed that.
So, so when did you make the the transition from Coverdell and Company to the the Senate Minority Leader's office? I didn't. I never oh, worked. You for never Paul. did. No, never worked for Paul in the Senate Minority Office. Oh, okay. I worked for him in his business, and I worked for him in his campaigns, not as a vol just as a volunteer. I never was okay. on his staff. So, you you, you mentioned. Um, the party, which is which is interesting, because most of his party building activities were run out of the company. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. So, so tell tell me about sort of the you know, Coverdell's the crowd that he kept you know, close, the, the the kitchen cabinet, and, and who who were his close associates that were helping him build the Republican Party, as you'd say. Um. Richard Bell. Always very close to to Paul, um, Frank Strickland, um, Hank Schwab. Well, no, Hank wasn't that close. He was, yeah, I mean, he was and he wasn't. Hank was, um, he wasn't a, a confident of, of Paul's. They they were close. They worked together on some things. Um, uh, Scott Hansen. Um, and there were people, Paul had, had a lot of uh, relationships with people outside his own district, up into, uh, up into North Fulton. There was always kind of an adversarial, back then, uh, relationship between Buckhead, as they called it, the, the, all the people in, North count, in the north part of the county just said Buckhead, and by that they <laughs> meant Atlanta. Um, but the, the folks in the north part of the county and, um, and, and his own uh, constituency. And, you know, from that, he just kind of worked that out further and further. Well, a big part of it was getting uh, Fred elected uh, state chairman. This is Fred Cooper. Correct. And, of course, Fred was from Thomasville. And... Uh, and that uh, that prob that election probably expanded Paul's state contact network as much as anything. How, how involved were you in? Uh, b because I I think Joyce Stevens Joyce uh, yeah. Carter mm -hmm. would have been sort of really close to Fred and keeping right. the tallies and everything like that. But you would have been working through Coverdell's office at the time. How, how involved were you in sort of the, 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 the logistics of trying to you know, draft Fred, get Fred elected in 81? N not, not so much other than um, in Fulton County. Okay. I remember being, um, that the, was a very intense county commission. Uh, I think it was Matthew Patton that was running the who was who was from Fulton, which right. so that would have been important. Right. And um and I, I was very much involved in uh, I say involved I just had chores, I guess you'd say. And um you know, make sure so and so is here. Make sure so and so knows about this. Um I wasn't an actor, but I, I did go to the county convention, which was just, and I went as a delegate, which was just a brutal. Uh, it, descri dis describe that, that because you know the Republican Party, those those county conventions during those formative days, especially in the well, '80s, were. Well, it was huge. The turnout was incredible, and um, it was one of. I'm. I'm getting my conventions mixed up. I think that was the one where uh, Jack Sells, I th think, was county chairman. Um, anyway, th there was uncertainty about, um, w it was one of those where it was hard to read whether some of the things that were happening, whether they were friend or foe. Sure. Um, there was also some very ugly personal stuff that is the kind of stuff you'd have to take out, so I won't go into that. Say but, no more. 
but on the floor, I mean, just some really uh, ugly, confrontational kind of things. Um, but uh, the people that we wanted elected to the district convention, uh, we prevailed. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, I think that's that was the same with the with the count uh, with the uh, state mm -hmm. delegates. But um, but I was basically just a Paul would say do this and I would do it. Um, that's what my boss does. And that's <laughs> what I do. <laughs> but a lot of it was just uh, about making sure so and so knew what the strategy was and knew what their role was and had the people there and made sure nobody went home early and that kind of thing. The the important is sort of logistics of, of running a convention. And, right. And people have to be in the right place at the right time. Right. It was but it was kind of the grunt stuff. But it was it was both fun, but that one I remember being very tense. Well, you mentioned that, that when Fred was elected in, I guess it probably would have been like May of 81, uh, when he became the state party chair, that it expanded or amplified Coverdell's uh, influence within mm -hmm. the party. What did, what did you, how did you witness that or, or recognize that his influence had, had grown within the party? Well, he and Fred talked all the time. And... I mean, Fred was very much his own man, but I don't remember too much divergence between sure. the two of them. Um, and, um, of course, we were also on the high of Reagan having been elected and Mattingly, right. shockingly, having been elected. I've, one of my favorite stories was, you know, everybody thought Mac had lost. This is 1980 when he yeah, was running against right. uh, Herman Talmadge. Correct. And, um, you know, the returns basically were in, but Cobb County hadn't come in. And uh, I was watch, watching television. Um, this was like five in the morning. And, and it, it turned. And I knew Paul, was, Paul and Nancy had gone home and gone to bed. And I thought, do I call him or not? And so I called him. And uh, he was, you know, <laughs> what? <laughs> Whoa. And I said, Paul, the cop is coming in like seven and eight to one for Mac. And this, it's, it looks like he's got a shot. He did it. I mean, he was ahead at that point. And, um, and it was like Paul would, had been up all night, I mean, up all day. He, he was just instantly alive. And, um, it was because he was really Mac's main strategist. Uh, I mean, I probably a lot of people claim that mantle, but he was he was the one that had the vision of how it could get done, and um, and it would not have happened without Paul. So it wasn't just Fred's election; it was that election that. Because Paul was so easy to underestimate. Why, why do you think that was? He was a small guy. He had kind of a high-pitched voice. He, uh, he almost looked frail. He was very thin. And, um, and you just didn't realize the power behind his brain won, but his will. I mean, he, he was just relentless and um, just could not be, I mean, anybody could be discouraged, but he, it, he was never down for the count. I mean, he was always going to pop back up. And, um, but anyway, that was, so we had, I mean, Reagan had, had come in, um, Mattingly had gotten elected. Finally, we'd elected a statewide, uh, plus a couple of county, I mean, uh, public service commissioners were mm -hmm. elected that year. And, um, and so Paul, particularly because of the Mattingly thing, Paul already was, people understood that this was a guy that knew what he was doing. How involved was, was Newt? Because he had been elected in 78. 
Um, how much contact was there between Coverdell and Gingrich up in, up in Washington? There was a lot, but it wasn't always, they were often not in sync on things, was my impression. Um, I mean, Newt Stahl was always more combative than Paul's. Um, I mean, Paul, you didn't want Paul as your enemy, but it wasn't because he was going to stab you in the back. Not that Newt would stab you in the back, but he would pick up something and hit you on the head with it. I mean, <laughs> Newt was rough. He sure. played rough. Okay. And um, more and more as time went on, but, um, but that wasn't Paul's style. Paul just kept coming, kept coming, kept coming, and just would wear you down. <laughs> but um, so they were, they were very much um, in touch with each other, but they were not, uh, they didn't, they're t tactically, I think you'd say, they were not in sync I see. often. So the, something that, that, that other people have talked about is, is this network of point people that, that Paul had throughout the state, part, mm -hmm. of, part of that network or that organization you mm -hmm. were talking about, uh, the sort of the eyes and ears. Yeah. Um, tell me about how, how that came about, how he held them together and sort of, you know, when the bat signal went on, everybody you know, assembled to, to mix my superhero metaphors. <laughs> but. Um, at the time, it didn't seem like that's what it was. Mm. It just seemed like he had a big Rolodex of people who um, who liked him and who respected him. It wasn't like he had done favors for all these people. Sure. Um, but they just, once you had worked with Paul or seen him in action, you realize if he believed in something, then you ought to pay attention because it could happen. And... Um, and, and certainly Mac's election was, uh, was evidence of that. Um, and, he was, and also, the other thing, too, he was very close to the Bushes, very That's close right. to, to George Bush. And um, he and Nancy um, vacationed up, up there with them. Really? Uh-huh. Uh, uh they would go to um, Kenny Bunkport and... Um, um, he was, Paul was known to be connected, what, particularly what, with the Bushes. What do you think attracted uh, Paul to, to George? As you mentioned, this was sort of the, this was the Reagan revolution. Right. But, but what attracted Paul to uh, George H.W. Bush? He had been, they had been close since 76. Okay. I mean, I think that was the first time, because Bush was sort of mentioned as being a candidate then, or being in the landscape, because he he had been Republican National Committee chair, right. CIA China ambassador, right? And uh, but he and Paul at some point um, had Paul was a Bush believer early, and then when when eighty came around, he was all in for Bush, of course. That worked out so that Bush was in the in the vice president slot, but Paul was um, was all aboard. Um, you know, a lot of people of the more moderate ilk, not that there were a lot of them, but those that were, you know, they they weren't sure about Reagan, um, but Paul, boy, never he he never blinked. Uh, once Bush and Reagan were um, were a team, he he was all in. And um, Paul also was a prodigious fundraiser. Um, and that was a talent he developed through the years. But he, uh, he understood how to get money moving and, uh, and was good at it. Was that something that you would do is help organize the, the fundraisers or anything like that? No, that was his own. He just knew who to call. He didn't share that information. Interesting. He, um, at least he didn't share it with me. 
And, uh, but he knew how to get it done. So were, were you still working with uh, Paul when he became state party chairman? Uh, let's see. That, that would have been 85. No, I was, um, I had left the company in 83. He was really good to me about this. Uh, I, I wanted to go out on my own and freelance um, as a writer. And there was a lot of writing involved in the company, marketing kind of writing. And so he gave me a contract to continue. I think it went on about a year, maybe less. Uh, but anyway, I, he was my first big client, in effect. Okay. And I always thought that was more than good of him. Um, but I was, I mean, I certainly supported him for chairman, but I wasn't deeply involved in, I, I just couldn't understand why he wanted to do it. Well, I think I know what you mean, but but, but just describe I never, your thought it was behind just that. so many headaches, just so many, and and there were it just seemed like to me there were ways that he could influence things the way he had in the past, uh, without being in that role where he was just going to have to put up with every complaint, every. Uh, annoying person, every difficulty. I mean, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's a lot of it. And um, anyway, obviously, he had a bigger picture than I did. Um, but the party at that point, the tra trajectory, although it was slow moving, it's it was upward. It was clearly... Republican Party was as ascendant, maybe a strong word, but moving up. Very different from the early 70s. Very different. Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, it was in sight that we could um, control the houses of the legislature. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was, that was, what really shocked me, though, was when he, uh, in 88, when he, took the Peace Corps job. Uh, that, that, was, that was a big surprise. Because he stepped away from because it was partisan just, politics? Not so much. It was just, I guess I thought he would have wanted a bigger job in the administration. Not that it's an unimportant job at all, I would have, it was just so different from what he, um, anything he had done that I was aware of. Sure, sure. And um, it was apolitical, which again was different, but, um, but evidently it, he, he loved it from what I've heard. Uh, of course, I wasn't working for him then, but... Um, it, and and it put him in a good position then when uh, and Mac had lost in 86. Mm. Weich, Fowler was, and I guess Paul throughout this time realized he was going to run for that seat. Right. He didn't talk about it, at least not to me, but, um, but I guess it positioned him well. So when you, you stepped away from the company in 1983, mm -hmm. how active did you remain in politics, in, in Republican politics? Um, I guess I was as, you know, when he called me, I did something. When Still? Paul, yeah. And then, um, but he didn't call me that much, particularly, of course, after the Peace Corps thing. There, he wasn't. So that was not a time I was real active. Okay. Um, but then in 88, uh, I, I did get re active again for Mike because um, Paul gave up his Senate seat to go to take the Peace Corps job, and Mike ran for his Senate seat, which right. was a, uh, a, that was a very, uh, intense election. How, how so? Um, because Paul, 
had been there since 72, 70, 70 maybe? I think yeah. 70. So, so tell me mm -hmm. why 88 would have been an intense race. Well, um, it was a special election. And Say no more. <laughs> <laughs> well, but Richard Bell ran. Okay. And Richard was a good guy and uh, had been a faithful supporter of Paul's for years. Right. There was a sense that I think, you know, that th this Mike was Coverdell's guy. Right. right. This it's his turn. Okay. Um, Mitch Scandalikas ran. Mitch was kind of a uh, his tactics were different. He didn't play it nice. <laughs> Um, and there were a couple of other people who ran, but, um, but Mike had name recognition. He had, uh, his, the Christ the King network. He had his lawyer network. And that, and that's the Catholic church. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, anyway, I went to work for Mike and, um, and we won. It, it was a runoff, but. We led handily in the first election and then won the runoff. But that was, um, th there was a lot of, w that went into that. It was not just a, a yawner of an election by any means. There was a lot of work involved in that one. Sure. So I was kind of back in it after then. Whenever, I mean, Mike was back in, in the Senate, so to the extent that he had opposition after that, uh, I worked for him. Um, he didn't have a lot, though. Right. Well, 1988 is interesting because that's where the the, the, the Pat Robertson folks, the uh -huh. the the, um, the so-called Christian right. Yeah. Um, what do you, what do you what if anything do you remember about that sort of uh, dust up between the the regular party and the, and then sort of these these newcomers, the the, the Brant Frosts and the 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 religious right. Well. Um, I think they prob that was probably I don't remember that being a factor in um, in that particular election, the eighty eight, the special election for, right. for the Senate seat. Um, thereafter their um, their influence was more apparent. Um, and there was a sense they had a tremendous ability to turn out votes. Um, where I do remember it being part of the discussion, although I wasn't specifically involved, was 92 when Paul ran uh, for the Senate. And um, Paul was, that was not his natural constituency. And uh, trying to figure out how to hold them once the primary was over. Right. Um, was, that was very much part of the... Right, because that, that the primary had Bob Barr um, and John Knox, who was, I think, from Waycross, who mm -hmm. was sort of yeah, the... Right. Um, and Barr had been in Congress, and he, he had... But he was much more... At that point, he turned out to be kind of all over the place. But at that point, he was um, he was considered the conservative, and the uh, more in line with with the emerging um, Christian right. Mm. And um, that Paul that was not their nat that was not his natural constituency. Right. Um, so did you did you work on because I I think I read somewhere that you worked on or, or consulted for um, Johnny Isaacson's campaign in 1990 no. or worked on, you didn't mm -mm. what about uh, Coverdell's campaign in yeah, 92 you did, did you did work but it was a volunteer as a volunteer okay but I was working um, he that's where I met a Whit Ayers has that okay. name come up um he was a pollster yeah yeah he still is a pollster oh, yeah. Um, he's in Washington now. He was based here then, and uh, that's where I got to know him. But um, there was uh, 
that whether holding holding the right was um, was a big part of. How, how do you think he managed to to do that in in the general election? Because you know, White Fowler, um, you know, who there must have been a third candidate in there, I, and I've. Um, this is, I should have. Oh, there must have been a libertarian in the general election. Because that's what threw it into a runoff. But I can't remember now who it was. And, uh, but I knew, I know we felt like if it gets to a runoff, we're golden. And, um, and it, that's what it turned out to be. Um, so. So, you know, why did you think the runoff uh, would be where, where Coverdell would, would be able to overcome? Just organizationally. We could turn out people. Republicans were more organized than well, right. the and Democrats. He, he, was, he had always had a turnout operation. Um, the, the old mantra, mantra used to be, find them, vote them, count them. And, um, and he believed in that. And um, you identified your voters, you, uh, you turned them out. And his organization was always based on that principle. Did you stay in touch with him while he was a senator? Or, or was he just yeah. off in Washington? He was off in Washington. I see him every once in a while. Um, I remember just thinking, gosh, he's skinny. Um, I mean, it just seemed like he was disappearing. But... Um, but I'd, I'd see him every once in a while. But, you know, he just was, he, Paul was just somebody you could, uh, and Mike the same, just felt good about having worked for. Um, and there's not too many you can say that about. But, um, but he uh, always felt Paul, I mean, his motives were right. He doesn't mean that I would agree with everything he did, but um, you could trust what he did. And, uh, and that's how both of them were. There were a lot of Democrats, particularly going back to the 70s, who were that way too. Um, there were some really good people in the legislature back then who, um, and they worked well across, I mean, Mike worked well with Robin Harris, with Elliot Levitas, with Sidney Marcus. Um, and Paul did too. Um, Paul worked with Roy Barnes well. Um, they had a very close relationship. Yeah, they did. Uh huh, they did. But um, you know, there, there was it was just a different tenor. So, you know, Senator Coverdell you know, died very, very suddenly, very unexpectedly. Um, where were you when you when you heard the news that he had he had passed away? Um, I guess this was back in 2000. Um, well, I call, uh, I talked to the Egans, mm -hmm. and um, Mike had been up there uh, when he heard that Paul was going into surgery. And, and he talked to Nancy and had found out that they weren't really going to do surgery. So that was pretty indicative that um, that there wasn't it wasn't a hopeful situation. Um, so when he died, I wasn't surprised, but um, it was just so tragic. What a loss! You know, I wonder at times whether the the whole tone was changing. Um, and it would change more. So, of course, he was a big George W. Bush oh, guy. Yeah. And um, he could have been maybe uh, helpful in some things um, to George W. Bush. Um, not that, not that uh, Zell wasn't. Right. But, um, but, I mean, George was, he was a Bush guy. And, and could have, would have carried water, any water he needed to carry. Um, 
but Paul, I think, as as the tone of politics changed and and, and Congress became so vicious, um, I, I don't know how he would have handled that because it, it was so contrary to the way he was. Mm. Um, Do you think he, he and, and you know to the same extent Mike Egan would? How how do you think they they would fare in, in today's political environment, or do you think they'd even I don't choose think, to? I don't think Mike. I think he, Mike would not engage with it. Uh, my that's my opinion. Sure, I could be sure. wrong, but I don't. I think it's not what Mike would do. He would just have made money as a tax lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Paul, I don't know, but you know, there's just there's not a path for a Paul type right now. There's not a path for somebody who is um, who isn't confrontational and isn't doesn't come from anger, but comes from wanting to to get something positive done. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, I'd be interested to know how other people who knew Paul would answer that question because he loved politics. I mean, his impulse would have been to be in the arena, but whether there was a place for him in the arena in this climate, I don't know. Did, were you involved at all in the, uh, the special election um, after Paul passed away? Um, wait, I, I think, no. No. Have you have you done much in politics since? I haven't. No. No, you know it's. Um, Writing is a full time job as somebody who's who's written. It's it's a not lot. that so much. I mean, I live in Fayette County, which although it's uh, not as Republican as it once was, it's, but it's not my kind of Republicans. I mean, they're good people and all, but it's just, um, you know, I, I feel like I've worked for two of just the best. And um, it's hard to work for people that you feel like aren't the best. Well, I mean, that, that's an interesting segue into, into talking about how, how much Georgia politics has changed since you first got involved. Um, what, what was it like when, when you, you woke up and, you know, day after the election, 2002, the, a Republican, Sonny Perdue, had been elected governor. The, the state Senate switches, and then a couple years later, the, the House switches. What was it like for somebody who, who had worked in the party back in the 1970s to see that transition finally uh, come about? I was glad, although um, I also was kind of glad I wasn't in the middle of it. Um, but it's funny, the morning after Purdue was elected, um, I was out walking my dog. This was before sunup. And I ran into Patty Nally. Paul's, Paul was gone by now, but his sister-in-law. Patty had been his sister-in-law. And, um, and we just hugged each other. Uh, I mean, here in the middle of <laughs> the not in the middle of the night, but sun up one sun up the sun hadn't come up, and it was just joyous um and yet at the same time, you know once you're in, then everything changes, and I'm kind of glad I was involved when we weren't in, and when everything was very humble and you know, you could dream about the day when maybe, but at the same time, you were just doing what you could do under the circumstances. It was just, I'm glad I was involved when I was involved. Right. Well, it seems like we're, we're, we're entering a period of Georgia politics where it's going to get a lot more competitive. Yes. Um, for, you know, for a period, you know, the Republicans have been dominant basically right. since 2002. Um, you know, do you, do you think it's likely this is going to be a, a period of intense competition? Yes. 
I think so. I mean, I think that the um, the turnover in Cobb and Gwinnett demographically, I mean, they were the heartland of right. Republican victories. And um, now barely held on to one congressman and lost the other seat. Um, I think I think that the metro area um, that was kind of the energy base of the Republican Party is up for grabs. Um, I don't know. I, 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 but yes, I think it'll be very competitive. I think it's going to be real interesting to see how she does. And she being uh, the new senator Kelly Leffler. Leffler, uh huh. I didn't know if it was Loeffler or Leffler, mm. but um, I hope I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but because um, she's going to have a primary, yeah, on, uh, with, with against uh, Congressman Collins, right? Doug Collins, right? And um, I think that there were. There was a time when suburban women were dependable Republican voters. They're not anymore. Uh, what, do, what do you think accounts for, for, for that? We, we've talked about demographic change and, and the suburbs and, and college-educated white women uh, living in the suburbs. Why now? Why t 2018, 2020? Why has that transition come about? And, well, and Trump is a big part of it. Um, he's a big turnoff, I think, to that type of voter. And then um, the other thing is, I think there's a sense of, uh, and this may help her, help Kelly Leffler. Um, you know, why does it always have to be a man? You know, wh why does the party always, why is that just assumed that the candidate is going to be a man? Mm. And, um, I think that enters into it. You think that 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 uh, that's added to the the, if not problems, the, the potential weaknesses of the Republican Party here in Georgia that it is, or it seems to be a very white male dominated absolutely organization. Yeah, I mean the the Republican Party as I knew it, and that made me think it was an attractive alternative, was about good government. It was about fiscal responsibility. It was um, it was a party that you could identify with on terms of feeling like it would make things better. Uh, but now it's you know it's just become fighting over the pie. It seems like, and um, and that's not very inspirational. Um, but the, you know, so many of the people that I first knew in in Republican politics, whether they were brought in as part of the Goldwater movement mm -hmm. or whether they went back to the Eisenhower days, that's how they understood the Republican Party, and that's why they chose to identify with this ragtag group that was always, it seemed, it seemed going to be in the minority because it stood for what they believed in. And, um, and that just is all uh, cattywampus now. <laughs> so do you think we'll get any clarity in the next, uh, we're, we're, on, we're only nine months out from another election? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I guess if we knew, we, we would probably be very rich and doing something yeah. else. I mean, I. I I think the alternatives that seem most likely on the Democrat side are uh, almost as problematic or more so than Trump. I'm not a Trump person um, and, uh, and think he's, I th the thing about Trump that makes me ill is every time things turn his way and he has an opportunity to build from it, he does the opposite. 
and he is just so stupid that way. Obviously, there are a lot of people that would, you know, fall on their sword for him, but he could have built something that he'd be a shoe in now if he had just a few things handled differently mm. instead of just being an a-hole. But he always chooses that option. And it just, even people who want to be for him and appreciate some of the things he's done, it, it just grinds you down. Mm. Um, but then you look and see Bernie Sanders, a socialist, um, Elizabeth Warren, a liar, um, Biden, who seems kind of incompetent. Um, there's not, uh, the, the Democrats, I, maybe Klobuchar still would have this opportunity. If they could get somebody across the finish line that wasn't just wildly out of the mainstream, they would walk away, I believe, with November. Mm. And I know we're not supposed to, I'm not supposed to be a pundit here, yeah. and I'm not trying to be, but it just seems like uh, both parties are just lost in the woods. Mm. I don't know what the Republican Party is anymore. Um, I mean, really, because the Trump agenda, other than judges, is just so unsteady as far as any Republican principles as I've understood them. Um, like I say, good government, um, fiscal responsibility, just uh, not part of the picture. Right. So, I mean, You'll probably want to cut all this. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, but it, it's it's interesting to talk about that the transition in, in in priorities, policy priorities, because that was a very big part of of the, the, the those Republicans who came up during the Reagan Bush era, which was, um, and I've talked about this with with, with several others who who worked and then and, and and were involved in the party at the time, but it was very much a. Inter internationalism, mm -hmm. um, yeah. the NATO alliances, free trade. Well, I mean, um, Jack Kemp, immigration. Balanced budgets, yeah. things like that. But, oh, yeah, Jack Kemp, uh -huh. perfect example. And, um, and the sense of America being um, a force for good versus just a, you know, cut your piece of the pie as big as you can. Um, that's what I feel like has been lost, and and I don't know what I don't know what the future is. I, it's almost like this the whole scene is scrambled and maybe needs to redefine itself. Yeah, the the, the political scientists we you know they they call it realignment, right? And, and, and it feels like you know that you know with how quickly um, demographics have shifted with suburban voters now seeming to be very reliable, you know, Repu uh, yeah, excuse me, Democrats. You've got Democrats in Georgia representing Sandy Springs, Dunwoody, Buckhead. Uh, that, that would have been unthinkable in the 1980s, 1990s, that Democrats would be coming in and winning huge majorities. It in, could in be unthinkable like now. If, I mean, I think it's no, not unthinkable, but mm -hmm. we're not competitive in places that we would be competitive or maybe even have the advantage, in my opinion, if it were not for Trump. I think his, um, the, the, the turnoff of the, the suburban, particularly the woman suburban vote, is, um, is decisive. Mm -hmm. Now, he, I may be proven wrong this time. Well, I mean, that, that's that's uh, that's always a possibility, and that's uh, you know the risk we take with oral history. But but I appreciate. Um, I'm not going to take up any more of your day. Uh, I know you got places to go. That's why you're here in Athens. But uh, 
Lee, thank you very much for, for, for an engaging, uh, interesting morning and uh, well, really do appreciate it. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you. On, Good on, memories. Uh, well, absolutely. And uh, thank you on behalf of the Richard B. Russell Library here at the University of Georgia. I really did appreciate it. Thank you.